Through the years, people have sought refreshing things. Wherever refreshment could be found, there men gathered. In colonial America, the favorite gathering place was the local inn, with its welcome promise of drink for the thirsty, food for the hungry, lodging for the weary, and good keeping for horses. At the inn, men gathered for refreshment and to enjoy sociability. They liked to talk business, for they were men of affairs. Their affairs were the problems of the day, and in solving those problems, they laid the foundation of our great nation. Horses provided the only means of overland communication. Towns were far apart. Travel was difficult. When the courier arrived with the mail, his destination was the town inn. His first thought was for refreshment. So what could be more natural than for understanding citizens to curb their impatience for long-awaited letters until the rider had quenched his thirst? There was another kind of gathering place then, too. Springs of natural carbonated waters that issued from the earth. From here, from there, from everywhere they came, seeking the refreshment that nature provided. Those people were fortune's favorites, with leisure and means to travel and visit the natural carbonated springs of their day. Their pilgrimages turned those watering places into centers of relaxation and gaiety. However, the reason why the waters sparkled and danced was one of nature's secrets. And in colonial days, man had yet to learn that secret. At this time, an English clergyman with a flair for chemistry believed that man could discover nature's secret, could produce sparkling, effervescent water, could make it available to all. His name was Joseph Priestley. His laboratory was makeshift, his apparatus crew. His genius combined products of nature to make a product heretofore found only in nature, carbonating gas. Priestley captured the gas. He forced the gas into a keg containing plain water. He rocked the keg to mix gas and water. The experiment was successful. Priestley had produced the first man-made carbonated water. No longer would people have to travel to distant springs to enjoy the carbonated waters of nature. Forty years later, in the apothecary shop of Townsend Speakman of Philadelphia, another important discovery was made. Druggist Speakman knew something about taste. He believed that people would enjoy carbonated water more if it were flavored. So he added fruit juice. Then he used sugar to sweeten the drink. The result was the first flavored carbonated beverage. Here was a pleasant and palatable combination. Here indeed was a new idea. People liked the drink, called it soda water. Through the years that followed, Speakman's discovery led other men to make further experiments in taste. They called on nature's storehouse for flavors, blending old ones, creating new ones, mixing, tasting, changing. They were seeking new and intriguing ways to provide syrups for the carbonated beverages now becoming a part of American life. From here, from there, from everywhere they came attracted to the current counterpart of the inns and watering places of colonial days. The new gathering place of a new age, the soda fountain, helping to make the 90s gay. Here was happy sociability, life and gaiety among those who stopped for refreshment. And here, too, was a new drink that people were talking about. Syrup. Finely chipped ice. Bubbling carbonated water. Yes, people talked about it, tried it, and even then learned the happy enjoyment to be found in the pause that refreshes. This was progress, growth. And although they had no one-way streets, they did have the modern convenience of one-way pockets. 
An eager public demanding carbonated beverages had created a new industry and had made the soda fountain an established part of American life. But the thrill of the soda fountain could not be taken along as men and women enjoyed another thrill, the automobile. The automobile put people on the move, taking them to places where there were no soda fountains. With the horseless carriage came, besides goggles and dusters, a whole new pattern of life. The motor car was destined to change the habits of the nation. It had a profound effect on the industry that supplied refreshment. Streamlining was far in the future. But thirst and the need for refreshment were ever present with people who were, even then, learning to play as vigorously as they worked. The great American game. And those strenuous citizens who took their exercise by paying others to play for them would have welcomed the great American drink. Take Me Out to the Ball Game was a favorite song of the day. And what a hit it would have made with these fans if somebody had taken their favorite drink to them. So to keep pace with demand, men began to bottle the national drink. Early bottling plants were small. Machinery was crude, methods slow. The proprietor was his own one-man production crew. Occasionally, a bottler enjoyed the luxury of a helper who was seldom permitted to do more than wash bottles, using lead shot to clean the inside of the old-fashioned bottle with its wire loop stopper. The heavy sleeves and apron, the stout gloves, the catcher's mask, all these afforded needed protection. Filling a bottle was a hazardous undertaking. In this step of the process, almost anything could happen. Butler knew that there was a great future to his business. It was a one-horse business then, limited by the distance a horse could travel. But in bottles, the drink could go anywhere. There was no limit to the opportunities ahead. The pioneer bottler may have sold only one case at a time, but he was expanding the frontiers of his industry. Building for today, when modern distribution methods would bring sparkling, gleaming bottles to people everywhere. Today, the bottle supplies refreshment to people wherever they are, goes with them wherever they go. Today, bright and cheerful soda fountains are the streamlined gathering places of a streamlined age, offering refreshment, relaxation, sociability to all. Today, in making all this possible, many industries cooperate with their products and services. The story of the refreshment business, like so much of the history of American commerce, is the story of partnership in enterprise. In growing from simple beginnings to its present stature, this business has helped other businesses to grow and has, in turn, been helped by them. One of these is the glass industry. Before refreshing drinks could be placed within arm's length of desire, bottles were needed, practical bottles that could be made economically in great quantities. Glass manufacturers found the way to meet this requirement. Glass making, one of man's oldest arts, has become one of the most modern of industries. Here, skilled craftsmen direct fabulous machines. Fiery furnaces yield an endless flow of molten glass. Sharp blades cut the stream. White hot blobs drop into waiting molds. Iron hands receive the molten mass. Spin it, twist it, turn it, and start it on its way. Other hands catch hold. They press and form the fluid glass, mold it into shape, giving each the distinctive character that identifies this bottle for people everywhere.
Yes, fabulous machines. They contribute to your enjoyment of refreshment by producing bottles in a never-ending phalanx, sparkling, gleaming. Here, American ingenuity and American labor have combined to produce typically American cooperation between industries. Glass has widened horizons for refreshment. Refreshment has, in turn, provided an ever-growing market for glass. Another partner in enterprise with the refreshment business is steel, Vulcan's cauldron. Here, guided by strong, sure hands, boiling metal is tamed to human needs. Steel mills and steel men fashion material for many major uses of the refreshment business. The roaring furnaces these men control produce steel for buildings, steel for machinery, steel for trucks, steel for scores of different uses. Besides providing markets for established industries, the beverage business has created whole new industries. The making of bottle tops is one of these. Men feed flat sheets into hungry presses. Biting, biting, biting out the metal, they produce steel shells for bottle caps. Shells by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands, shells by the millions. To make each shell an airtight bottle seal, cork is needed. Cork from strange far places, processed and cut to size. By skilled and knowing hands, in ingenious machinery devised by other knowing skillful hands, metal shells and discs of cork are brought together. They emerge the modern bottle crown, a perfect seal to lock the life and sparkle in the carbonated beverage of today. Far away in sunny fields of sugarcane, men and women keep busy so that other busy men and women may keep refreshed. From rich, abundant soils comes the harvest of carefully cultivated sugar crops. It starts its journey in rough, primitive carts. Merchant ships of the world continue this odyssey of commerce, transport raw sugar to refineries. The sugar industry hails the carbonated beverage business as one of its largest customers. The needs of one have broadened the facilities and operations of the other to the mutual benefit of both. Today, modern syrup manufacturing plants mark the growth of the refreshment industry. In spotless surroundings, amid gleaming stainless steel equipment, trained men work with unhurried precision. Their job is to blend sugar and other good things from the far corners of the earth into syrup for refreshing drinks. The scientist has joined the beverage manufacturer. Beverage making has become a science, like the preparation of other pure food products. Constant tests safeguard purity. Every ounce must conform to rigid standards of uniform quality before the syrup goes into containers, ready for the first step of its journey to you. Off it goes, barrel after barrel, to bottling plants in the north, the south, the east, and the west, large and small. Local enterprises owned by local capital, employing hometown folks. Bottling plants are important factors in the business life of their communities. Inside these plants, men and machines unite in the job of bottling your favorite drink. Men start empty bottles through the washing machines. From then until the final step in the bottling process is completed, Human hands direct, but do not touch a single bottle. Out of the washer they come, bright, gleaming, sparkling clean. There's rhythm in their march, the smart, efficient rhythm of modern industry. The filling starts. Each bottle receives the right amount of syrup. Round and round the bottles go, while carbonated water is measured and added. Round and round to the capping machine, 
where the modern bottle crown seals each one and safeguards the purity and wholesomeness of every drink. Round and round the bottles twirl until syrup and carbonated water mix to form the finished beverage. Round and round, bottle after bottle, moving endlessly to satisfy the needs of thirsty people everywhere. Refreshment on the move. To take the drink to market, more men are needed and more machines. Today, motor trucks, the seven league boots of modern business, provide vital transportation, serving every city, reaching every crossroad. Yes, carbonated beverages in bottles can and do go wherever people are and wherever people go. For people at work, refreshment makes a pause a pleasant, happy moment. The bottle rises to the occasion for a workman who wants to flavor lunch with refreshment. It supplies a new and welcome service at the service station. Goes along with people bent on recreation. Is a happy aftermath of sports, summer or winter, since thirst knows no season. At home, Refreshment supplies the pause that keeps a housewife going. It serves the needs of hospitality, is a winning trick that every thoughtful hostess knows, adding life and sparkle to a gracious scheme of living. And behind every refreshing scene is a marshalling of men and materials, nature's products from the far corners of the earth, refined products in an endless flowing stream. The carbonated beverage industry requires lumber, lumber for kegs, for cases, for many uses. Its wares roll to market over the transportation facilities of the nation. It needs the product of the glass maker. It needs bottle tops, millions of bottle tops for millions of drinks. Steel ingots glow with fiery iridescence, supplying stout metal containers for carbonating gas. Mills hum with busy activity, making steel for signs. The beverage industry needs steel for trucks, thousands of trucks to carry refreshment everywhere. It needs steel for coolers to refrigerate carbonated drinks. Because of beverages, the ice man finds more work, sells more ice. The container business has a whole new market in cartons to take refreshment home. And it needs men as well as materials, men to make drinks, men and women to sell them, soda dispensers, dealers, retail merchants, waiters and waitresses, delivery men, vendors. It has become a great modern industry affecting many other industries. All year round, this business employs thousands directly, indirectly provides work for hundreds of thousands more. From the first glass of effervescent water made by Priestley, from Speakman's revolutionary experiments in sweetening and flavoring this water, from the gaudy but gay soda fountains of grandfather's time, and from the crude but ambitious plants of pioneer bottling days, the carbonated beverage industry has traveled far. It has made available to all what was once one of nature's luxuries. And in turning Priestley's discovery, as well as Speakman's daring idea into a product of everyday enjoyment, this business has fostered and promoted the American tradition of cooperation between industries. One business helping another. Partnership in enterprise to bring you refreshment through the years.